on your feet and give him 10 seconds of praise. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I tell you, you're going to get loud today. Your quads are going to be burning before this service is over with. Let's do it again. Ten seconds of praise. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. Give him a shout. Now what's going to happen over the next few minutes is all the depression you've been carrying around and passing out and the discouragement and the, the defeat that the enemy has tried to put on you is going to fall off of you. So we're going to have to call Serb Pro to come clean up the floor because God's going to vacuum up that junk today. By the time you leave here, you're going to feel the joy like you've never felt. That's what the Lord says. And much like first service, we've literally going to have two completely different services, what the Lord told me. And uh, if you were in first service, raise your hand, because I think some folks stuck around for that. And uh, first service, just get loud for me for a second, would you? Because You may be seated across this house. The Lord spoke to me on December the 18th and 19th of this last year. He said, I will shout in 2016. And the Lord gave me 16 prophetic statements. And one of the things he said was, I will visit the churches that have been contending for it. I will send the camels as well. Camels all through the word of God. Anytime you see them means finances and blessing. And I want to speak that over the house four times this morning. I saw gold piling up across this house. I saw gold. I saw gold. When Pastor Al handed something to me this morning and we went to pray I saw this pot of gold now that's that uh, you may say well Pat are, are you name it claim it no I'm not I'm shout it and grab it and uh, and so you can't live by faith every single week and not walk in the authority of that amen so if you have a poverty spirit I will make you mad early but but the Lord says he's going to begin to bless some of you like you've never experienced and I need you to understand as I get ready to move into this word in just a moment. Karen and I are at home. I pulled up into Pastor's Al, Pastor Al and uh, Mama Tava's uh, driveway on Thursday afternoon. And the Lord said to me, welcome home. The minute I got out of the car, he said, welcome home. And there, as I turned, Pastor Al was standing there. And uh, he is, uh, and I won't go belabor this, but uh, uh, he, they are our, our spiritual parents. And uh, they are my brother, Scott, and Sister Christie's spiritual parents. God gave us this family. And he gave us this house. So when I come here. I have a freedom to preach the truth. Are you with me? Because I go to a lot of churches that don't want the Holy Ghost anymore. They fired him because they watered the blood down. And when you remove one third from a hundred. It leaves the number 66.6. .6, which is the spirit of the anti-anointing. Spirit of the antichrist. But what I love about coming here is. Because uh, church I want to live somewhere between amen and, and there it is. Um. There is a freedom here that you're not going to find. You're in the safest church in America. You're in the purest church in America. You're in a church that believes in the freedom of God. You're in a, you're in a church that will discipline you because God is not an uncle. He is a father. And what you have to realize is God has handpicked this house for now. And the Lord spoke to Karen and I and he said, you are to take an, uh, an, an altar first and it will be deposited in this house. And so for those of you that were not here Friday night, shame, 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 um, you have one requirement, one one homework uh, that you. I was a secondary med, a uh, secondary education major at first when I went to college, so I'll give out the homework today. You have to watch Friday night. You've got to watch first service this week, and uh, because you're going to get wrecked, you're going to get wrecked in your car, you're going to get wrecked at work, you're going to be worthless. I tell you, you're going to be a rag in the hand of God, remnant. And uh, but there's a freedom here that is very real, and I want to go ahead and give an aspect of what happens. In our services because I don't know about you but when I get to heaven I don't want my lifestyle to change but I do want to get to heaven with nothing left to do 
And what you call a tombstone, God calls a mile marker. He's taking you to another level. And over the next few minutes, the Holy Spirit's going to invade the room. And when he does, the altar's open. The altar is the raised platform made of wood, stone, or steel in which something's brought forth to die upon. And you have to understand, when God begins to move and begins to change you, and, it, and it's his goodness that draws you in, when that begins to happen in you, it begins to transform your mind. It, it transforms everything. Are you ready for the word today? Amen. Amen. My beautiful wife brought an unbelievable word yesterday, and um, God is using her to set, uh, to open prophetic windows all over the nation, but was just in Brazil where she saw thousands because Pastor Allen, Mama Tava recommended her. She saw, I think, 14 or 16,000 women wrecked by the Lord. It was just so powerful in Brazil. And do you have a picture of that? Bring that up. And um, uh, the Lord just moved so mightily in Brazil. It was just so pure and so powerful. But uh, now God is using her with her new book, uh, Dehydrated and um, and some other things, but uh, Karen, would you just stand and, and wave at everybody? Because it don't matter if you're ugly, as long as you're anointed, God gives you a hot wife. Amen. <laughs> Twenty six years, I've been her arm candy, and um, but I, I've got to tell you about something before I move into this word. I want you to grab your Bibles and open to Daniel the third chapter. But <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, they love us out there. I feel him. I want to say to those in this room that partnered with our ministry and let us be your missionaries to America, we will see 100,000 souls saved this year. And if the Lord speaks you to partner with this ministry and you get one of the cards and we will pray for you every day and tomorrow uh, there will be a video in your email that will come called the New Face of Royalty. I just preached it last week at my son's youth ministry out in California where Nate's youth pastor at and they're seeing a couple thousand students touched uh, at their big events and it's crazy but thank you. We pray for you every day. Please check out the books and all the stuff back there. I am remnant, unqualified, dehydrated. But Pastor Al, uh, one year ago the Lord began to speak to me and he said, ask me for the keys to the kingdom. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 16 verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. The word keys means power and authority. The word there in the, in the uh, Greek is klis. And so I began to pray for the keys. Two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, we were in uh, Orange Beach, Alabama. And we were down there because I, I, I belong to, I'm on a board um, of, a, of a ministry. Uh, Steve Hill Ministry who led the great revival. He's gone to be with Jesus now and he's having a better time than us this morning. But we were walking down the beach and I had prayed for a few moments. I said, Lord, give me the keys. And, and, and over the last year, he's been begin, begun to give us keys. One is on entrepreneurial anointing. Another one is on uh, rebuilding the altars of America. Every month, he gives me a new key. One is that he will shout this year. The people take joy in the shout of the Lord, Psalms 84, verse 10. And the Lord began to get, download these keys. So Karen and I were walking down the beach in Abby, the three of us. And by the way, Abby's here. Abby, stand up. Would you make her welcome? This is our little gift from the Lord. Hopefully she'll be in the next Olympics and uh, making money for daddy. And uh, But we're walking down the beach and I had just prayed, God, I want the keys. Give me the keys. And all of a sudden we're in an abandoned part of the beach where there wasn't a condo or anything. We're just walking, just goofing off. And I suddenly see this key laying in the ocean. And I saw it and I stepped back because I had just prayed it. And then I said, Karen, did you see that? And then I lost it. The wave rolled in. It was gone. And then Karen goes, there it is. And we picked up the key. Now, obviously, someone can't get in their condo now, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> but we picked up the key. And we had it framed. And I told my team to go make a copy of it. Pastor Alan Taba, we had it, a, a replica of the key, an exact copy of the key, put in this box for you. Because the Lord said to me, he's going to give you the keys to the kingdom like you've never experienced. And, and so we made this for you. 
I must preach now. I must preach because the Holy Spirit is going to move. He's going to move powerfully. Uh, one of the keys that God began to speak to me, he said, I want you to change the way you're doing things. How many of you understand Matthew chapter 12, verse 37 says, for by your words you'll be acquitted, but by also by your words you'll be condemned. Are you with me so far? And the Lord began to speak to me about what I was to share. He woke me up early one morning in Phoenix, Arizona. And I was laying there in bed. I had to go speak at a conference. And all of a sudden he said, I, Pat, have you ever noticed that when I move in a service, it's not when you talk about what you're doing? See, because God does not care about your ministry. He cares about his name. I am tired of meeting people that tell me who they are before I see who he is. We, friends, are not in sales. We're in advertising. You are called to be a mobile upper room. When you walk in the room, demons ought to be diving out windows. In fact, God is about to raise up the unqualified remnant, the ones no one else would ever pick. They don't have degrees on the walls. They, 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 they haven't been raised in prestige or high society families. No, God is about to raise up the rags in his hands and to clean up the messes, the, no, the ones no one else would ever pick. You're going to see prophets rise up. You're going to see evangelists rise up. You're going to see psalmists rise up. And people are going to step back and go, no way. And they're going to scream, Yahweh. But the Lord spoke to me early one Saturday morning. He said, I want you to brag on me. I said, what do you mean, God? He's, because I, I can be ready to walk out on stage to five people or 10,000 people. It doesn't matter. And he'll always say to me, Pat, simply be a stagehand. Open the curtain. If they can see you, they cannot see me. He says it to me all the time. And laying in a hotel room bed in Phoenix, Arizona, where I would have to speak three hours later, he said, get your laptop. I'm going to give you a message that you're to declare for the next year to my people. I said, all right, Lord. And in an hour and 15 minutes, he gave me what I'm about to deliver to you. He said, Pat, if you will share this for 30 to 35 minutes, I will heal bodies in the room. So you need to get prepared. And the Lord told me to write a simple message titled, I am about to brag. Because I'm reminded of the darkest time in history. We think now is intense with ISIS and all the different cultural changes and all this stuff. Because trust me, we're in the battle. You wouldn't believe the letters we get. You wouldn't believe the attacks that have come. Every time we're on television, you would not believe this stuff. I've learned that when I check the mailbox, if it doesn't have a reply address on it, do not open it. We hold it up to light, make sure there's not a check in it. Amen. <laughs> then we throw it away. Got to check for the check. Check for the check. But truth is a new hate speech and the enemy of truth is silence. And God is looking for those that don't mind. Because I've learned if you're not coming up against the devil, it's because you flow with him. And sitting Christians hatch hypocrites. And what you've got to realize is some of you are not in the battle. You're not. You've got this perfect little life going on because you're not a threat. But I do not worry about I do not worry about Satan, a phantom menace. I do not worry about him because greater is he that's in me. But the Lord spoke to me, if you will brag on me, and I'm reminded of the darkest time in history. When Israel was under bondage. When Judah had been captured by an evil king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He was conquering the land like a Napoleon, like an Alexander the Great. He was spreading like a virus across the land, overtaking. Israel was under God's, they were under bondage. They were under God's curse. And God allowed them to be captured. And all of a sudden, as Nebuchadnezzar, this narcissistic, bipolar king, who was so full of himself that his throne alone was seven miles wide, he would go into the land and he would capture the land. He would take the idols from the temples of Baal and remove all the idols and place them in his temple to Baal. He would go in and he would capture the articles from God's holy temples and put them in his temple to Baal. And as he would travel throughout the land, he would take the brightest, the best, the most talented, the most gifted, the, the most uh, brilliant, and he would force them to serve in his evil dominion. Obviously, Pastor Al and I would have been chosen for that group. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. 
But then he would take the men and lead them away with giant fish hooks in their mouth tied to poles. And he would force the women to serve in his concubine. But what he did not realize, in the midst of his conquering, he captured a remnant. He captured some that would not bow. You ain't getting this yet. That's all right. Because I'm about to brag. And all of a sudden, as he would take and deliver and force the people to give the chief the, or the best meat, they would be offered to the sacrifices or to the idols rather as sacrifice in his temples. And, and he would bring the choices of meat and place it before the idols, but the idols wouldn't do anything. That's why the Bible says that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to eat of any of the meat. It's not because they were vegetarians. It's because they would not eat of something offered to idols. Hello, television. Finally, he got so frustrated that his idols would not do anything that he decides to build an idol to himself coming to a neighborhood near you. He gathered everyone around and he said, now when praise and worship starts, everyone must bow. I do believe that if we're not careful, we're raising a Saul generation that loves worship more than word because it soothes their demons. When Jesus said in John the fourth chapter, worship me in spirit and truth. In the word. I would say that 90% of many sermons that are preached across America on this Sunday morning had yet even one scripture. Because we have learned to live off of people's homonies and parables and stories. And so all of a sudden, when the idols wouldn't do anything, he got so frustrated, he brings everyone together and he said, when worship starts, everyone bows. And the Bible says in Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to come back to this again at the end. The Bible says in Daniel the third chapter that as he declared the music when the trumpets went off when everything began to play and everyone in the kingdom bowed at his golden idol he had built there across the vast sea was four young men three that I'll speak of by the name of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that said we will not bow and his ire was up his anger was so intense that one of his little minions runs up to him and says hey there are three slave Hebrew young men three young men that you place in high position because it don't matter where you're at God will bless you he'll elevate you and all of a sudden the Bible says they bring them forward in Daniel the third chapter he looks at them and says if you don't bow down you're going into the fiery furnace and suddenly the three young men step up and said oh king your majesty we want you to know we will not bow before your idol because our God is able to deliver us but if not oh listen to what I'm talking about we are living in a day and age where you get a better get a but if not praise if it doesn't happen the way I want it to happen if I don't get blessed like I need to be blessed he's done enough I've got a but if not praise inside of me it don't oh you better get a hold of this when God gave me this message, I flew home from Phoenix and I said to Karen, for the next six months, we're going to brag on God in every situation because the power of life and death, Proverbs 18, 21, is in the tongue and the fruits you will eat up thereof. And you have to understand. I said to Karen, I said, for the next six months, we're going to brag on God. And when she got a doctor's report that she had cancer, I came out of my prayer room upstairs, came downstairs. Suddenly she's standing in the middle of our living room, just worshiping and praising. And I said, did you get a call? She said, I got a call. They think it's cancer. And she said, but I'm going to brag on God. Let me tell you what happened. Three days later, the doctor called back and said, we're wrong. There's no cancer there. I serve a God of the morale. Oh! If you will change the way you approach. I'm about to mess your family up for the next seven days. Everything you've been waiting on is about to shift. God sent me to tell you. First service, I did not preach. The Lord told me in the service, you will not preach this service, but second service, you will preach. I've come to tell everybody in this room that have been waiting on your miracle. If you do what I tell you to do for the next seven days, you will change your finances, you'll change your babies, you'll change your marriage, you'll change your marriage, uh, your, your partnership, you'll change your business. Get all, give it. That's fine. Ten, fine. Ten seconds of praise. Get up on your feet. Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Oh!
And they said, but if not, your majesty. Somebody say, but if not, we're still going to praise him. You may be seated. The Lord sent me here to preach a message simply tight. I'm, I'm about to brag. He said, Pat, have you ever noticed I do no miracles and services when you talk about what you've been doing? I could tell you all the miracles. I could show you all the pictures. I could show you what God's been doing, but I can't do that. I'm going to talk about him today. In fact, you got to understand it. He sent me to brag, so I'm just going to brag because I remain confident of this. Psalms 27. I will see the goodness of the Lord in this land. There is a revival coming to America. There is a giant wave. I write about it in Unqualified. There's a giant wave coming to America. One last move of the Spirit. And what you got to realize is the Lord is going to move over the next few minutes. And I'm he just sent me to brag, so I got to just shut up and brag. Psalms 34, verse 1. Probably the most different message you've ever heard. Get ready. Psalms 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. The humble and the downtrodden. Ha <laughs> ha. We'll hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify. That means he's bigger than your spectacles. Oh, magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. Some will dismiss this as shallow, but I'd rather call it hallow. You need to understand in heaven right now, they are not screaming. The angels are not screaming, maybe, maybe, maybe. No, 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 no. They're screaming, holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 holy. you got to realize I do not want to be out of place when I get to heaven. In fact, I, I, sometimes I make our family do rapture practice. My son would come home from high school, from football practice, and he'd have a friend with him, and we'd be eating supper, and all of a sudden I'd just go, rapture practice, and he'd go, Dad, don't do this. His friends would go, what, what's, what y'all doing? Nate, who's a youth pastor out in California now, would go, don't worry about it, bro. I'll explain it later. Abby, who loved to provoke her brother because she knew how mad it would make him, would go, do it. And all of a sudden, I'd say, when I blow the trumpet, everybody's got to jump up and say, "Woo, he's here. Nate's friends would look at us like, what, what are y'all doing? Nate would be sitting there going, Dad, don't do this. Dad, don't do this. Dad, don't do this. He'd be soaking wet from football practice, whatever. And all of a sudden, we'd just be eating along. And all of a sudden, I'd go, ba bam And everybody in our family has to jump up and go, "Woo, he's here. Now he makes his teenagers do it. Passing on that generational blessing. If you'll get a hold of what I'm about to preach, my friends, if you will understand where we're going, this will change the very atmosphere of this city. What are you talking about, Pat? Listen to me. Complaining is not intercession. That's intermission. And when you lose your purpose, you begin to embrace your passivity. And what you've got to understand is God is about to shift the church back to a level where they understand who he is. I got to brag on him for a second. Psalms 9 verse 1. I, go, I will give thank to you, Lord. With all my heart, I will tell of your wonderful deeds. Oh, listen, church. It's Romans chapter 5. We continue to shout our praises even when we're hemmed in. There comes a moment where you got to bless him and praise him. This is where I've been living, and it has transformed me. And I'm reminded of Dr. S.M. Lockridge, one of the greatest preachers that ever that ever lived pastored Calvary Baptist in San Diego we were just in San Diego several weeks ago saw an outpouring of God for several days the awakening of the remnant there my lord I wish you'd shout a little bit 10 seconds of praise 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 give him a shout I hear the sound of joy coming into your bones. You about to get your tongue cut out and replaced with praise. Running around talking trash every day, complaining, whining, acting like God ain't doing what he's doing. Sit down. See, listen to me now. It's going to get worse. Fire. Hold on. Raise your hands. Holy Ghost. (laughs) 
I do not care what the doctor says. That doesn't matter to me. That sugar's coming back into place. See, we must behold him again. What you behold, you become. Some of you look like the garbage you've been watching. You don't even realize you dress like that. Posting pictures with a scripture and holy has nothing to do with anything but the clothes you're wearing. Running around saying, bless the Lord, and you got to, I'll stop. I don't need your soft porn. I've got a hard rock right here. What you behold, you become. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, And we who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What are you talking about? See, I'm going to be honest with you. The Lord sent me here to change your mind. I got to brag. Psalms 103 verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy, holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. Forget not all of His benefits. Who forgives all your sins. Heals all of your diseases. Somebody shout right there. Who redeems. That word is gawal in the Hebrew. Purchase with blood. Ransom. Who redeems your life from the pit. Crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Can I be real honest with you? I'm tired of going overseas to see miracles. I'm a missionary to America. But when I go overseas, I see crazy miracles. I'm reminded of a young lady that walked up to me in Singapore, 16 years old. Rods in her back, had been in a horrible accident. She's a little dancer. And she said, would you pray for me? And all of a sudden, we laid hands on her. She went home to her Hindu household, who took her to her Hindu doctor. And they got a Hindu MRI, because something felt different. And the doctor came out and said, they, she has been to see a holy man. Because all the screws and the rods are all gone. The next night, she danced. Reminded of recently when a, one of the, there, there, there's five apostolic uncles over the house church of, of China. What we call fathers, they call uncles. And recently one of the sons, because they're in their 80s and 90s now, one of the sons who's about to take over in, in a nation where it's illegal to be a Christian, in a nation where, where um, one million are being saved a month. So you're worried about what the government does. I ain't worried. Create the famine and we'll, we'll provide the feast. They worry. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, one of the sons gets arrested. He's in his 60s for preaching the gospel. They put him in a prison, and they announced that night that all the prisoners could kill him. Well, that was like feeding meat to ravaging dogs. These men. And all of a sudden, throughout the day, as he would walk through the prison, the and I heard this <laughs> firsthand. As he would walk through the prison, the prisoners would say to him, we're going to kill you tonight. So that night he lays down on the floor, not like our luxury hotel prisons we have here. It's just open roof, floor, dirt, all the stuff, holes in the ground, go to the bathroom. And he lays down on the ground and he said, Lord, I'm coming to see you today. I can't wait to see you, Father. And he fell fast asleep. But as he fell asleep, his light, or his body began to light up like a globe, like a giant lighthouse, and lit up the entire prison till suddenly every guard and prisoner fell on their knees and began to repent. And he got kicked out of prison the next day. Because, see, you have to understand. It's Romans chapter 8 and also over in Timothy. For I am persuaded. Three most powerful words in the Bible is I am persuaded. But you have to understand, I, miracles and mir after miracles after miracles happen overseas. But why don't I see them in America? Maybe God would rather move into an illegal house church where death is imminent for the worshiper caught praising than into a government-sanctioned legal house of worship where he is confined to the intellect of a church growth conference, a clock of sustainable growth, an altarless service, a song service designed to arouse the bride and has nothing to do with the bridegroom, a prepackaged humanistic message with a never-ending consumerism of a powerless church with plastic faith. 
And we've not seen the harvest because the harvest has been about our harvest instead of the Lord of the harvest. In fact, he told me, he said, Pat, set up three chairs and remind my church who I am. So I decided to set up three chairs today because I don't know about you. There has been days where I've had to sit down in the lap of the Holy Spirit and I've had to say, comforter, do something inside of me, refresh me, renew me. I've had to say, ignite me with a fire. There's other days where I've had to crawl up in the lap of redemption, in the, in the son's lap and say, forgive me, change me, restore Restore me. Work this out of my life, God. I don't want this in my life. Get that out of me. But there are other days as of recent because of some crazy dreams for America where I have had to do Romans chapter 8 in the Message Bible. And I've had to curl up in the lap of Father. And I just say, what's next, Papa? What's next? And you have to understand, this is who God is using right now. God is using the braggers. I'm not going to go long, so stay with me. God is using the braggers. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. But you know what I've learned? God is using the braggers. You know, when you first go into ministry, you are God's gift to the church. You tell everybody, I'm going to change the world, stadiums. I don't even know how the kingdom went on without me. You're so full of yourself when you look in the mirror, you don't even see Jesus anymore. Then you go through some things. You go through that cave. You go through that wilderness. It amazes me how people want the platform without the wilderness. That's the opposite of how Jesus did it. It says, being full of the Spirit, heaven opens up. This is my boy. Greatest PR moment in history. He disappears and goes and fights every possible sin you could face, the three temptations. Then he comes out of the wilderness and it says... Let out by the Holy Spirit, his fame spread far and wide. Don't ask God for the platform until you have the death. But follow me. But when you first go into ministry, you're like, God's going to use me. Then when you're in ministry for, the while, for a while, the first 20 years, all you do is mark your territory. You want everyone to know what you're doing. You just brag on yourself. Oh, yeah, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. Mm-hmm. But then when you start hanging out with fathers, when I hang out with uh, some of the fathers in my life, when I hang out with an, an Al Bryce, what I found out is they no longer talk about themselves. They no longer talk about what they're doing. All they can do is talk about him. It's the graduation moment. Any of the fathers I get around, this is what they do. When I'm with Reinhard Bunke, it's what he does. He just talks about Jesus. I just sit and cry. Because you have to realize God is using the braggers. What are you talking about, Pat? Because if we're not careful, our church services most of the time are built around reminding each other who we are of who we are instead of who he is because I think so often we don't want to hear who he is for fear of forgetting who we are because we've forgotten how to stay at the cross when's the last time you had the attitude of the cross what is the three things he said I thirst I forgive and it's finished until you do those three things God can't use you but if we continually have to remind each other to take up the cross and follow him then you have yet to reach your Golgotha because you're still wrestling in the garden of betrayal When the Bible says, behold, he makes all things new. When the Bible says, if anyone's in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I'm a new creation. It doesn't mean he took me and ran me through a car wash. It means he took Pat, killed Pat, and resurrected a new Pat. I'm not my own. I was bought. In fact, the Bible even tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, I am his ambassador. I'm a mobile upper room. When I walk into rooms, demons ought to be diving out windows. Because something in you transforms the atmosphere. He said, my house is so depressed. My house is so, my family, we're just all under this thing. I want to look at the heads of the household and say, well, quit being a little sissy and rise up and get out of bed early, pray, walk the perimeter of your yard, take the authority back, speak in tongues, prophesy over your children, wash your wife's feet. Then we'll find out how much joy you got in your house. If that is offensive, there's a long line to the left. Now listen. But God spoke to me. He said, I'm going to use the braggers. In fact, when I wrote this book, Unqualified, I wrote it because I had dealt with a failure spirit for so many years. I even write about dancing in the minefields of Gettysburg when God broke that off me. He said, go dance where others have died. He woke me up early one morning and he said, that depression that comes on you about every six months, we're going to break it today. I look like a fool out there on FaceTime with Karen dancing. I am so white. I get to heaven, I'm going to be black. But anyway, that's another thing. Actually, I'm going to be black and Asian because Abby wants us to be both, and so I'm going to be Blasian. But, and and, and all, all the black people in here, you're going to be white. Deal with that. 
talking about you be trying to dance going, what happened? Listen. But the end of yourself is the beginning of God. And when the Lord gave me this book, he took me to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 through 28, where it says, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called in this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. He goes on to say, isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that culture overlooks, exploits, and abuses? He chose the nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. And I thought, Lord, that's exactly who I am. But then do you know why he gave me that scripture? Because all you got to do is go to the very next verse, verse 29. Why is God using the nobodies? Why is he using the ones in here that you call yourself illegitimate? Although I've never met an illegitimate child. I have met illegitimate parents. I'm always amazed how parents talk about this generation as if they had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Well, my my kid's out of control. I'll move on. Don't read my books. I'll just tick you off. But look at verse 29. Why is God using the nobodies? So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, my God. Let the one who boasts. Let the one who boasts. Let the one who boasts. Boast in the Lord. Get up. Give him 10 seconds of praise. 10 seconds of praise. 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 2, 1. Sit down. We must change the narrative. What are you talking about, Pat? When you brag on God, it suddenly replaces your flesh man with a spirit man that's been dying to get out. When there is less of your issue and more of his glory, then suddenly the scenery changes. Two years ago last week, my son, my pal, Nate, played high school football, then college football, and found out he had a spinal disease. We laid hands on him over and over. Finally, he found out my grandson Jack was going to be born. He called me one day and he said, Dad, I need to have the surgery. It's a major surgery, eight and a half hour surgery, rods down his back, refixing his spine. I said, well, let's do it. The Lord's not going to, we need to do it. The Lord hadn't healed you. We show up at Baylor Hospital. The night before we laid hands on him at the hotel, I said, Lord, when he wakes up tomorrow, because I see miracles every week. We see cancer. We see all this stuff happen. I said, we didn't know that Nate would see Jesus at the end of his bed that would radically change him in his recovery. So that was why he had to have the surgery. I'll let him tell that story here someday. But I'll never forget. We go to the hospital the next morning and all of a sudden the doctor says to me. Says to Karen and I, we're standing there and he says, now listen, he could die today. He could come out paralyzed. You need to be prepared. I got overwhelmed with fear. All of a sudden I walk out into the foyer of the hospital. They're getting ready to take him back to surgery and I'm just like, God, you got to do something. I can't handle this. I can't handle it. I can't handle it. Fear overwhelmed me. They came and got me and they said, the chaplain's here to pray. All of a sudden I walk in the room and everybody's gathered around the bed. There's a little chaplain standing there at Baylor Hospital down in Houston and everyone takes hands and he looks at me and goes, we're going to pray for the young man. He don't understand rednecks, does he? And all of a sudden, I look at him and I go, I got this. I really did. Didn't I care? I went, I got this. He went, looked at me, and I took, we all took hands. Nate's laying there. My daughter and love Adrian standing over there. And all of a sudden, I went, Listen, when your baby's in trouble, you ain't worried about being politically correct. I'm not trying to get invited to preach for him. My son's hands are up in the air. There's wires going everywhere. Next thing you know, they, they're taking him away, and I'm still overwhelmed. Karen went to pray in one area. My daughter in love, Adrian, went to call her mom and pray. And I get in this open area, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm down on my knees. I'm just down on my knees, and I'm overwhelmed with fear. And I said, Lord, Lord, be with my baby. Be with my, be with my boy today. And all of a sudden, God whispers in my ear, did I not tell you he would shake the nations? And he said, am I not enough? I said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And then he said, get up and dance. I said, Lord, there's a hospital. There's people all over the place. It's like a big hospital. A lot of people. Dance. 
Next thing you know, this white boy is dancing all over that hospital. I'm praising. I got legs flailing. I got belly going out. It's far lost way. I mean, I got stuff happening. Uh, my boobies were everywhere, and I'm dancing. Guess who came walking by? Chaplain Bob. I'm dancing before the Lord. Next thing he leans in and looks, that brother ran. I think he retired again. Listen. But there comes a moment when you got to brag on it. I'm going to brag, I'm going to brag, I'm going to brag, I'm going to brag. I'm about to brag, I'm about to brag. He, I got to change the equation. I got to change it. He is an awesome, majestic, mighty. Oh, by the way, now Nate's leading about 2,000 young people every single week. And he's perfectly fine. And, and the Lord has used, that's his youth ministry right there. So there you go, devil, shut up. Well, this is different from Friday night in first service. The Lord said, joy is to come back into this house. I'm going to brag. That's fine. Y'all sit there. He is an awesome, majestic, mighty, all-powerful, all-encompassing, all-knowing, all-seeing, compassionate, supernatural, all-loving, fiercely jealous, without ex- I ain't done, without excuse, mind-altering, heart-rendering, soul-purchasing, spirit-reviving, bondage-breaking, peace-empowering, covenant-creating, soul-purchasing, heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool, Satan-crushing, bride-washing, dominion-releasing, I am that I am! Oh, to brag or not to brag. If I could brag on him. Last time I was here at the missions conference that early that morning, the Lord said, what do you want from me, son? I said, Lord, I want somebody to walk up to me and ask him what, ask me what our ministry needs. That's never happened. And all of a sudden, this guy walks up to me at the end of the first or second service and says, the Lord sent me here to ask you, what do you need? And I went, go, 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 go. Because he takes joy in my prosperity. He gives the ability to create. I'm going to brag. That's fine. That's fine. You know what I've learned? When you add I and G to something, you make the verb come alive. He is renewing, transforming, transforming, rescuing, conquering, enabling. Uh, he is living. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Yet that's not enough. See, I want to be in a church. I want to be in a house that has Ed. Put me in a place that has some Ed in it. Everybody got a crazy Uncle Ed. What do you mean? The ed is the participle adjective indicating a condition or quality resulting from the action of a verb. In other words, it's the end result after something powerful happens. It's the ed. I want to be in the ed. I want to be on a Sunday afternoon with some ed. What are you talking about, Pat? He showed up. He vindicated. He transformed. He invented me. He rescued me. He restored me. He secured me. He delivered me. Put me in a church that has Ed by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm almost done. Holy Ghost is going to break out. Church, you got to get this. The days ahead are going to require a new level of praise. You can't get by with your Sunday morning every other Sunday Christianity. I'll show up when God ain't at the lake. I'd go to prayer, but you know, Saturday night, that's our date night. That's why y'all fight. Because these two taught us how to pray every morning in the power of agreement. With thankfulness of heart, we make our petitions known before the Lord. Philippians 4, 6. It changed our marriage. It changed our finances. You have got it backwards. It's as if God, you might give God some time when he says, I want all the time, then I'll give the two of you some time. And if you'll give me all the time, I'll change and transform your every now and then. Your, your once a week day, I'll change everything. But see, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. You got it backwards. You bought into the systems of the world that God is something to be worshipped on Christmas and Easter. When he says, you better understand I will bless the Lord at all times His praise will continually be in my mouth The days ahead will require a new level of praise You can't get by with your social club Christianity It's going to get intense I got to brag, that's fine Psalms 150 verse 1 through 6 Because y'all ain't going to shout with me, that is just fine Psalms 150, it says praise the Lord Praise God in His sanctuary, praise Him in the mighty heavens Praise Him for His acts of power, praise Him for His surpassing greatness Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet Praise Him with a lyre, with a harp and lyre Praise Him with a timbrel and dancing Praise Him with the strings and pipe Praise Him with a clash of cymbals, praise Him with the resounding cymbals Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord, oh praise Him Get up, 10 seconds 10, Nine. louder Seven, six, five, four, three, two. Give him a shout.
I gotta close, I gotta close, I gotta close, I gotta close, I gotta close. Listen to me. It's about to get worse. Don't you dare slip out. God told me to come and tell you the cross is not shifted. He has not filed bankruptcy. He's not worried about ISIS. In fact, Jesus said, here's what I need you to do for me. He said, the devil's time is running out in John chapter 12, verse 32. He said, you are in advertising and not sales. He said, here's what I need you to do. If you'll walk through your house and in your baby's bedroom and in your office place, he said, if I, John 12, 32, if I be lifted up, lift me up, lift me up, I'll take care of the rest. I'll start drawing it. Lift me up and I'll draw him in. That's what he said. Listen. Days ahead are going to require a new level of praise. Why? Because culture will attack you from every side. What used to be wrong is now right. They'll twist God's word for their own perversions. You'll get attacked when your absolute truth runs into their relevant truth. Cognitive dissonance will overwhelm you. You'll, you. Somebody you love will come to you and say, I got this issue. And they will convince you because of cognitive dissonance that that's okay when it doesn't line up with his word. Instead of having the authority to say, no devil. Even in the church, I'm watching all the prophets prophesy gloom and doom. And some of, we, some of these guys, we have the same exact publisher. And we got the Shemitah. And we got the four, four blood moons. One prophet recently just said, he said, ISIS is the eighth kingdom of Revelation. Then I went, hey, potato head. We've not seen the seventh kingdom yet. Recently, I was on the phone with a friend of mine named Sid Roth. He's one of the purest men on television. 76 years old. He's very pure. He calls me up. I was in California. And he, he says, tell me what God's doing, Pat. I went off. I start complaining about everything. I mean, oh, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And all of a sudden, he interrupts me. And he goes, Pat, Pat. You know the gospel is still the good news, right? And I went, yes, sir. Yes, sir, you're right. See, 1 Peter 4, 12, some of you are under attack right now and you act like it's strange. When Jesus said, this isn't strange. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, why are you worried about tomorrow? Let me, let me handle it. Just worry about today. Jesus was crucified between two thieves, yesterday and tomorrow. He's in our today. And I'll close with this. Can I tell you about the fourth man? The fourth man. Can I tell you about the fourth man? I feel like Rocky. I don't remember if it was Rocky 17 or 18. And he's fighting the Russian. And he pops him one good time and he starts bleeding. And he steps back. And he goes, you ain't so bad. You ain't so bad, devil. Here is Nebuchadnezzar. He's taken God's choice of servants. And he's saying, you have to bow down. And by the time we get to Daniel, the third chapter, when we go from verse 12 all the way up to verse 16, he, they're having an argument. And he's saying, you're going to bow, you're going to the fiery furnace. But next thing you know, all of a sudden, what they didn't realize, he looks at them and he says, throw them in the furnace. And what you don't wow. understand, turn that up for me. What you don't understand, bend as the minute you begin hard. to praise God, I'm yielding. At the minute you stand up for God when others won't. We put it into the fire. He will join the praise festival. He'll climb off the throne and get right up in the middle of it. Do not ignore my tears. I'm overcome by sorrow. I call upon the name of the Lord. And all of a sudden, my Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar sees the fiery furnace. He climbs off the throne. And he says, wait a minute, there was three put in, but I see a fourth man who looks like the face of the Son of God. And the Bible says when they pulled him out, the only thing that was burned was the ropes that had bound him. Can I tell you about the fourth man? I'm done. Don't you slip out. I'm watching. I'm serious. You'll change your family today. We've almost gone as long as a movie. Careful. The Lord said, tell him my resume and I'll be done. Can I tell you about the fourth man? In fact, he elevated those boys. 
And he went on to say, if anybody speaks against your God, I'm throwing them in the fiery furnace. He had a little bit of an anger issue. The Lord told me to brag on him this morning. I didn't know when I was going to do it. First, first service, he said, you'll do a second service. I said, okay. Suddenly, Pastor Al looks down at me and says, come up here. We're just going to flow with this. I said, yep. I turned to Karen right before he said it and said, I'm not preaching this week. <laughs> God saved this for you. Can I tell you about the fourth man? Because maybe you don't know who he is. Let me brag on him for a second. You better start getting excited now, early on. Because the Holy Ghost is going to hit. That little intense. Hold on. Watch. Let me tell you who he is. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. I had my team make this. You need to get this back there. Put it up in your prayer closet. It's got every name. I had my team make it for me. It's in my prayer room. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day. You want to see Jesus in the Old Testament? I'm trying to show him to you. Here's your prescription for your, for, your, for your ailment. Watch. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. And Joshua, he's the captain of my salvation. Do you know him yet? Do you know him yet? I'm giving you his resume. I'm trying to give. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. Ruth, my kinsman, redeemer, first and second Samuel. He is my trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, my reigning king. In Ezra, he's the guy that writes everything down. He's my faithful scribe. I'm going to hurry. In Nehemiah, I'm waiting on you to get excited. He's the rebuilder of broken down walls. And Esther, he's my Mordecai. And Job, he's, Job, he's my day spring from on high. In Psalms, he's my Lord, my shepherd. In Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, he's my wisdom. Do you know him? In Song of Solomon, he's my lover and bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. Jeremiah, my righteous branch. Lamentation, my weeping prophet. Ezekiel, the wonderful four-faced man. And in Daniel, he is the fourth man in the fire. Do you know it? Start prophesying with some of this. Go, 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 go. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband, forever married to the backslider. In Joel, give me some drums. In Joel, he's the baptizer with Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, my burden bearer, Obadiah, mighty to say, Jonah, the great missionary. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. You ain't getting this yet. You ain't getting it. You ain't getting it. That's fine. In Habakkuk, hold on. In Habakkuk, that's my boy. In the back, he's the evangelist, crying out, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Zephaniah, my Savior, who dances all over me. Haggai, the restorer of God's all's heritage. Zechariah, the fountain open in the house of David for sin and uncleanliness. Oh, and Malachi, he's the son of righteousness, rising up with healing in his wings. Give him a shout. Do you know the fourth man? In Matthew, he's the Messiah, Mark, the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he's the son of, son of, son of God. And in Acts, in the book of Acts, he is my Holy Ghost in fire. In Romans, he's my justifier. Corinthians, the gifts of the Spirit. Galatians, he is the redeemer from the curse. Ephesians, Christ of unreachable riches. Philippians, he supplies my needs. Colossians, the Godhead. First and second Thessalonians, he's my soon coming king. You're still not getting it. That's fine. First and second Timothy, my mediator between God and man. Titus, he's my pastor. He's my pastor. Philemon, he sticks closer than a brother. Hebrews, the blood of the everlasting covenant. James, the great physician full of wisdom. So first and second Peter, the chief shepherd. Shall appear with unfading glory. First, second, third John, he is love, 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 love. Jude, he is the Lord coming with ten thousand of his saints. And in Revelation, he's my King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You don't know him yet, do you? That's fine. That's fine. You don't know him yet. That's fine. You want this love? It's yours. Pray it over your babies. Watch what God does. You don't have no yet. Pray it over your family. Watch what God does. Oh my goodness! New season. Can I tell you who he is in the Hebrew? <laughs> Adonai Yehovah, the Sovereign God. This is whatever you need right here. 
the Lord Most High, El Olam, the everlasting God, El Shaddai, absolute sovereign God, Jehovah Elohim, my creator, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, I ain't done yet. I'm going to keep going for a second longer. We're going to find out if you want him. He is my Jehovah Nisi, my banner, Rafika, my healer, Shalom, my peace. Seek and do the Lord of righteousness. Make it each come, the Lord our sanctifier. Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, Shema, the Lord is present, Rohi, the Lord is shepherd. Hasanu, the Lord our maker, Elihanu, the Lord our God. I could keep going. Just let them roll. I ain't got time. I could go for days. Somebody lift your hands and brag. Brag, I tell you. Hold on, no music. We'll come back to the music. I'm going to give you one chance. What did you say? What did you just say? I've actually been told by people lately not to pray in tongues from the mic. That's fine. It'll amplify my voice. Because when I don't know what to pray, the Spirit makes intercession with utterances. There's a deposit in this house for glory. And God says this house has graduated. I stood in a room in your house this morning, Pastor Al. A very special room just over the garage. And the Lord says, I have left my glory in this room. Your house. Your glory is in that room. You were not robbed. You were deposited. It's going to get worse. It's going to be worse. Every eye shut across this room. I just gave you the resume of God. We'll brag in a moment. I got to do this first because some of you will talk yourself out of a move of God. Go ahead. Real soft, real soft, real soft, real soft. Tell me who he is. Who is he? What'd you say? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I, I, I've been not, not as... Jesus. 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 The name above all names. The sound of his name, every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that he is Lord. I just gave you the resume of God. What else do you need? with every eye shut across this house there are lost people in this room and the spirit of the Lord sent me here to tell you your time is up he sent me to tell you that he is drawing and calling and my Bible says in Romans that if I confess in my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord I shall be saved my Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved so do this for me everyone in the house even if you're not a believer say Jesus Say, Jesus. Jesus. It's going to get heavy. I'm warning you. Jesus. Jesus. Help me. Help me. He's right in front of you. He's right in front of you. He's right in front of you. He's breathing on you. He's breathing on you. There will be miracles in this service. There will be healing of bodies, minds, and spirit. But with every eye shut across this room, I will not beg you. I will not manipulate you. All over this room, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, dropped as a seed into the earth to set man free because the blood of goats and bulls and animals could not do it anymore. It simply laid it over layers over the sin, but he would come and abolish the sin. And what you have to realize is he was raised in anonymity. And at the age of 12, he would preach the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news, to bind up the broken heart, to set the captives free. Then he would disappear for 18 more years. At the age of 30, he would come onto the scene. Heaven would open up and say, this is my son. And then all of a sudden, he would go and begin to preach. And the Bible says in John 21, all the miracles he did on earth cannot behold in all the books of the world. 
in three and a half years. Then he was taken. He was betrayed. And he was led like a lamb under the slaughter. And he was strapped, nailed to a tree, took my crown for my thought life, pierced his spine or his, his brain for me. He was beaten and punched to restore my identity. And then his back was stripped so he could carry my sickness. And as he hung on a cross, barely able to breathe with no skin on his body, he forgave you. He said, Father, forgive them for they know what they're doing. And he became the lamb. And he was released into the heavenlies. He said, I give my spirit back to you, Lord, so you can pour my spirit out on the earth. And all of a sudden, the ultimate lamb led to the slaughter, went, and then after three days, he rose from the grave. After 40 more days, he ascended into the heavens. And the angel said, while you stand here watching, he shall return. And what you've got to understand is, there is a knock. There is a knock on the door of your heart with every eye shut. If you don't know him, that's his resume. He died for you. Give him your life. If you've walked away or never accepted him, if you have lost God, God says, now's your moment. And I will not beg, I will ask once. If you don't know him, don't you miss your moment. Praise saints. 